Well, let's begin our formal portion with our wonderful saying from our brother Julian, who is hopefully soon to be with us again as he tells us and reminds us all that we're to thank God for God. And let's say that all together. Thank God for God. What a wonderful thing for us to do as we think of these prayer requests and see his hand in all of them. It is indeed a tremendous blessing. Well, we come to our study tonight on the book of Ruth. Two more nights tonight and next week, and we'll wrap it up next week as we take our break there for the, the Christmas holiday. And then we will regather again on January 6th. And I'm very excited for the big reveal here tonight. Everybody ready? We are going to, yes, thank you for the drum roll. We are going to be going into the book of Esther next. So, yeah, thank you for your excitement and enthusiasm. I think it is going to be so great. It is just amazing. Esther is a book where uh, the, name, uh, the name of the Lord God or Lord or uh, Yahweh is not. Sovereignty of God is so incredible in that book. So you can start reading and preparing, and uh, we will move through the book of Esther in the Lord's time as we gather back again after the new year. Well, tonight we come to the fourth chapter of Ruth, our final chapter. If you turn to Ruth chapter 4 and verse 1 in your copy of God's Word. And as we come back tonight to this delightful book, the, the connection of, of all of this is so phenomenal to understand. Let's recap a couple of issues that we've talked about just to make sure we're prepared to move into this final chapter. We've been talking about the kinsman redeemer, that Old Testament concept of reviving a family name and preserving the property that each family within the nation of Israel was allotted. And this is such an important thing for us to recognize. You remember that as the children of Israel, the second generation, came into Moab and then into the promised land with Joshua, and they conquered the area that then the land of Israel was divided to each of the 12 tribes. And within the tribes, it was further divided into each of the families. And this land was to remain in the family. In fact, if financial hardship developed within the family and they needed to sell it after the Jubilee, the, the 49th year, the seventh year of sevens, the land was to be returned to the family. So it could be sold for a period, and depending on how long or short a period that land was sold with respect to the 49 years of Jubilee, it would be back paid for that amount, but it would be returned to the family. And that was a very important concept because the land was something that was intentional to those individual families, and there's so much behind that. I mean, when we start thinking about Israel and we start recognizing that the nation of Israel will, in fact, return to prominence to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant, this component of their land, of their family's land, is, is so important for us to recognize. Additionally, if the head of the family died, there was a provision in the Levitical law for the other family members to redeem the land. Also, as we've discussed, there was the provision for the childless widow to be redeemed. And in that way, both the family's land and the family name would continue through perpetuity. It, it's no accident that there were 12 tribes of Israel and that all of those within those tribes were given an inheritance so that they could perpetuate on the land. Well, this is just what was happening in Ruth. Ruth had returned with her mother-in-law, Naomi. She'd gone to glean food in chapter 2 and just happened to find herself in the field of Boaz that is divinely directed, not happenstance or accidental at all. And she divinely winds up in that field and we find out that they have affections for one another that seem to be developing. This would take us up through chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, Ruth approaches Boaz in a beautiful picture of humility and honor. And Boaz accepts her approach, but warns her that there is a closer relative. 
and then sends her home. And we remember as we understood all of those details, we found out so much. We found out from her garment, her simla, her mourning garment, that that is very likely why Boaz did not make a forward advance towards Ruth during that period of the wheat and barley harvest. Because it was evident to all, as one would continue to wear that mourning garment, that she was still mourning the loss of her husband. And so it wasn't until later that he recognized that and he was given uh, the green light, if you will, to move forward and to address her. And this came by Ruth's honorable approach to him that night at the threshing floor. Well, tonight we move to the concluding chapter of this great book. And, and it reminds me of an end of, of a great movie that we've watched over and over again or the end of a great powder day skiing. You know, you just don't want it to end. I remember going to Mammoth one day when it had snowed 51 inches and I'd driven all night to get there and it was so amazing. And I called my wife and I said, I can't come home today. I got to stay one more night. And that's this, this excitement of not wanting it to end is exactly how I feel as we come to the end of this book. It's been so rich and it's so great to look at these details. I just don't want it to end. Well, we don't need to lament just yet because there's a lot of great things that are still to come. So let's charge on. I've titled our message for tonight, as you see in your prayer guides there on the second to the last page, Pursuing the plan of God's prize. Pursuing the plan of God's prize. And our theme for tonight is three features of redemption which honor God. And so there'll be three points in our message tonight. And these make up our theme, these three features of redemption which honor God. So let's uh, read through our verses tonight, beginning in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 1, and then we'll make some comments about them. Follow along as I read, won't you please? Ruth 4 and 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself and you may have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in the former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witness today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. 
All the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Pursuing the plan of God's prize. Our first point for our message this evening is redemption's preparation. Redemption's preparation in verses 1 to 4. The first feature that appears in the layout is the location. And well, the, the city gate was that location. The city gate was really in many ways the main center of business within the ancient world. In that time, all of the cities were surrounded by huge walls, some of them 30 to 40 feet tall and as much as 8 to 10 feet thick or even thicker in some cases. The, there were two walls, an inner and outer wall that were constructed so that if an enemy came with a battering ram, he could penetrate the first wall but not the second one. There in these massive walls protecting the city. And within the wall was this perimeter gate. Obviously, they had to have an entrance. Usually in smaller cities, there were two. But in larger cities like Jerusalem, there were seven. So there were several gates that existed in these different cities based on their size. And the typical gate was not like we might think of it. It was not just a large pair of doors that were sitting in that outside wall. Not at all. Rather, what happened is there was like a room that projected off of the face of the wall. Usually it would be about 25 feet in both directions. So the gate was actually in this room that came forward. And it wasn't right in the front face because then a charging army could have momentum in many of these cities built on a hill. But nonetheless, if it was on the front face of that wall, they could charge that gate and seek to get an entrance through the speed and power of the animals that they might be bringing forward. So the gate sat on the side wall. So you had to make a 90 degree turn in order to get into that city gate, which was a further element of protection. And so these, these gates were a, a primary defense element in that they kept people from just charging into the city. But the gate was not just a protective element, although that was its primary function in addition to that place of entry, but it also was the place of meeting. Because as that room projected off of the wall, and it was a fairly large room, um, somewhat larger than about three quarters of our sanctuary area here, the other two sides of the wall would have benches along them. And it would be a place where people would gather. Israel is very, very hot in the summer, very similar to Southern California. And, and so it would be a protection from the heat because these rooms would be roofed. And so the people could escape from the cool and they could sit and they could chat and talk. Once you got inside the city, there were all the shops and businesses and it was a very, very busy environment or the area where the homes were. So this was a place where people could meet. It was a roughly open and common space and very important to, to understand. So as we understand that all of the, the gates did, we recognize that this was an important place in the city and this is why Boaz goes there as a meeting place. And then what happens? Well, then the close relative whom Boaz sought came by. And did you notice what the text said? Anybody see that there in that first verse? Behold. Remember what we've talked about regarding the word behold. When we see it, we have to stop and behold what is there. This is God's providence. That the, the closer relative just happened by. No, it wasn't happenstance at all, any more than it was happenstance that Ruth ended up in Boaz's field. 
So Boaz calls to the closest relative and he calls him to himself. And again, we remember the previous discussion of a relative closer than Boaz. We've seen it twice in our text, alluding to this situation. Back in chapter 2 and verse 20, Naomi addressed this as she called Boaz one of the closest relatives. Not the, but one of. And Boaz tells the same to Ruth in verse 12 of chapter 3, where he directly lets her know that there is a relative closer, although it is his desire to redeem her. And so Boaz asks the closer relative to turn aside and sit down, literally to change his course of action and come sit. In verse 2, the city elders are gathered as Boaz summons 10 of the elders of the city. These would be the older members of the family that were the leaders of the different families. And he gathers them together. The reason he does so, because in the Old Testament, it was the elders of the city who were required to verify legal matters, much like we might go to the, the courthouse to register a document. They also would have this process where the elders would come to observe and to hear and to interact on legal matters or matters of biblical content. In Deuteronomy 21 and chapters 18 to 21, we see this very thing happening as it relates to the circumstance of a rebellious child. If a child is rebellious, then the elders of the city are to be gathered to examine what's going on with the child. And the reason that we have that happen is because that's a very serious situation. And we know that from the punishment because if they find that the child is indeed rebellious, the punishment was stoning. Rebellious children are a serious issue in God's eyes. What an important consideration for our day and age, don't you think? So the first feature of redemption's presentation is the location. The second is the subject in verses 3 to 4. Look at verse 3 again with me. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi has come back from the land of Moab has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. Now that everyone necessary is in the location, we move to this subject. And the subject is the redemption. And we notice that the land is, is ascribed here to Naomi. It is her land. But it also belongs to Ruth due to her marriage to Malon. But why doesn't Boaz mention Ruth? Well, it's likely because he wanted the closer relative to realize that the land was the first part of the deal. This was the main component. The first thing that needs to be redeemed is the land. Remember, back in the Abrahamic covenant, that was one of the four parts of the Abrahamic covenant. It was a primary part, the land. God said he would give Abraham a land, and then he told him to go, and everywhere that he walked, those, that would be his inheritance. So the land was the primary component. He didn't want to encumber the bargain. He wanted to be straightforward in his dealings. He wanted the closer relative to understand what was there and that it was his right to first redeem the land. Now, land was and is yet today a big thing. So having more land showed more prominence, more stature, and also increased one's income. And he didn't want to hinder that. He didn't want to complicate the issue by mentioning Ruth. Mentioning Ruth would show the necessity of the marriage to her, and Boaz wanted the first part of this man's consideration to be based on that land alone. Boaz also mentions Elimelech. He is in many ways the, the most important figure, because under the Mosaic law, the land was never to leave the family, and Elimelech was the family head, the husband of Naomi and father of Malon and Chilion. And failure to redeem this land was a covenant violation. And we'll, we'll see more about that, so don't lose track of that. That if this land was not redeemed, it was actually a violation of God's covenant with the nation. So this wasn't simply an internal family matter. This was a very big issue theologically as their relationship to God. 
And part of the reason that God lists for turning Judah over to Babylon in 2 Corinthians 36, 21 is this covenant violation. They have not cared for the land. Thus, Boaz's efforts to have the land redeemed were very honorable and were God-honoring as God had commanded it. Boaz represents the deal to the close relative in verse 4 where he says, So I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people, that if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So Boaz makes mention of what's being proposed, the redemption of the land. And he mentioned that this is being done before the witnesses. This is a legal transaction. And he says, if you want it, then take it. But if not, tell me and I will take it. And then we see the response of the close relative at the end of verse 4. He accepts the deal. Now we don't know if Ruth is watching. But based on the typical public meeting space that, would, uh, that these would happen in the city gate, many people would gather to watch the goings on. Well, well, what are those people doing over there? You know how it can be, the looky-loo situation. And so many people would gather and want to see what was happening, and it would draw a crowd. And since this directly affected Ruth and Naomi, I think we can presume that they were in part of the audience was there, that was there. And as we think of that, we can only imagine Ruth's response at this point, can't we? Can't you just see the air go right out of her? <sighs> what? He's going to redeem it? And for that matter, how about the response of Boaz? Their hearts must have sunk at his response going, everything seemed like it would be going so well, and boom. This is something we can relate to, isn't it? I mean, sometimes you have your heart set on a particular outcome or a particular event. You've been diligent to faithfully seek it out. You have, you have taken it, it to the Lord in prayer. And then as you've done so, it's taken right out from before you. You know, we, we think of this at this time of season as it relates to kids and 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 presents and things that they desire for Christmas. And, you know, they're so excited about a holiday gift or, or maybe it's a young person and their desire to attend a particular college and you've done everything to pursue that option. You've let mom and dad know you want the Red Ryder BB gun. You know, give them any, every possible hint you could because that's just the bomb toy and you so want that for Christmas. And then when you think you're going to achieve it and you open the presents and it's not there. You don't get the gift. And the sadness is immediately evident. I remember we had, we lived in this little house on Walnut Street in Dillon, Montana, and I so wanted a TV. I'd seen TVs at friends' houses, and this was going to be the greatest gift. And I just pled with mom and dad, this would be a gift for all of us. I was a good salesman. Um, I've got two little brothers. Just think of all the entertainment that this would be for them. And the TV wasn't there, and I just cried and cried and cried. It didn't make any difference, by the way. But nonetheless, you can relate to the sadness, I'm sure. But this must have been Boaz's reaction, and certainly Ruth's if she was in attendance. But oftentimes, God allows this, doesn't he, beloved? He allows these things that we think are so needful and so important in our lives because he is at times examining us. He is helping us see where our faith lies. He is helping us see where our, two, our true trust is. And so Boaz honorably brings forward redemption's presentation. And this leads us to the second feature, which is redemption's process. The second feature of redemption that honors God is redemption's process in verses 5 to 8. Now verse 5 gives us the first step of the process where it says, Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. 
Now that the close relative has agreed to redeem the land, Boaz tells him of the second part of the contract. The next part of the obligation is you also have to redeem the lady. Ruth also has a tie to the land because she was married to Elimelech's son. Moreover, she was married to his oldest son. This information changes the whole picture in verse 6. This would interfere with the close relative's inheritance as it tells us in verse 6. Well, what does that mean? that it would interfere with his inheritance. There's, there are many aspects that this could carry forward with. He could be married without children. And this marriage to Ruth would create the possibility of a son that would be entitled to his inheritance above the son that he may yet have with his existing wife. Or he could be married with children. And this would still create a potential of having to share his current land with the offspring of a second wife. Or it could simply mean, which I believe is the case, that he is already married and recognizes the prohibition against marrying another woman. We know of the honor that Boaz has. We know that this is a family that has some uh, tremendous biblical strength and understanding. And I think it's likely that he realized that he could not bring another woman into his life as he was already married. But you can almost feel the sigh from Boaz, can't you? What? No? Oh, that's too bad. This is the close relative tells Boaz to redeem it for himself. Boaz is now clear to redeem both the land and the lady. And the plans which were rooted in Boaz's heart, the, the plans which he had shared with Ruth, were now free to be pursued. And Boaz would marry this dear lady who had been working in the fields these many months. She would no longer have to glean among the sheaves. Uh, God has now prepared a way that she would be restored redeemed by her relative, remarried in honorable fashion, in a God-honoring fashion. Redemption's process takes a step back in verse 7, where it says, Now this was the custom in the former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any manner. A man would remove his sandal and give it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. What we want to notice first about verse 7 is this is a parenthetical interlude. The narrator steps in amongst the conversation that's going on and he gives us some additional information that's necessary for us to understand what's happening here. Basically, the narrator breaks in to give us some legal, legal insight. He wants everyone to realize that this was the typical contractual arrangement in such cases. Now, the reason seems fairly clear. For one thing, the scripture does not address the means by with which these type of deals were to be ratified or accomplished. Some commentators feel it is in line with other scripture verses, like Genesis 13, 17. In Genesis 13, 17, God tells Abraham to walk the length and breadth of the land that he has given to Abraham. So somehow they feel there's a connection between the sandal and walking. Or, or in Deuteronomy eleven twenty four, In Deuteronomy eleven twenty four, 24, God tells the people that every place that the sole of their feet touches will be theirs. So perhaps there is a connectivity between the sole of their feet touching the ground and their sandals, which are then... Uh, being the, the method of attestation of this particular deal. So these commentators see that tie between the land and, the wa and walking on it. Another connection exists in Deuteronomy 25, 9. And here, the direct tie with the kinsman redeemer exists. When a man refuses to redeem, in Deuteronomy 25, 9, when a man refuses to redeem a childless widow, and he is the only one in the family who can redeem her, then the elders of the city will approach him, and if he still refuses to take her as a wife, then the widow is to pull off his sandal and spit in his face and declare that such it has been done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. 
So what we find is that the removal of the sandal is an indication of the abandonment of the redemption rite. So that's exactly what we have happening here. And I believe that's the exact tie that we need to understand. And all of these seem to have insight into the scripture, but the explanation at the end of verse 7 seems to hold better to that idea of the sandal as being that part which is representative of the redemption rite. So verse 8 returns to the direct discourse, and the close relative again speaks, and he restates the same thing as in verse 6, buy it for yourself. Thus, repeating the inability of him for, for him to complete the transaction. And then he removes his sandal to seal the arrangement. Now, we've mentioned how Boaz, throughout the scripture, is pointing forward to the greater kinsman redeemer, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Boaz was Ruth's kinsman redeemer, as Christ is our kinsman redeemer. And like Boaz, Jesus wasn't concerned about jeopardizing or comp compromising his inheritance, unlike that of the close relative. Instead, Christ made us part of his inheritance. He took us who were those that were not a part of the kingdom and brought us into the kingdom. In Ephesians 3, 6, it says this. In Ephesians 3 and 6, it says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's you and that's me. We are the ones who are those who have been made partakers, those who are not part of the inheritance, not part of the land and family promises of the old covenant. Another great similarity exists. Like Boaz, Christ made his plans privately, but he paid the price publicly. And like Boaz, Jesus did what he did because of his love for his bride, the church. Redemption's presentation, redemption's process, and our third point, redemption's preparation. These are the three layers of redemption's preparation that we see in our text before us today. Redemption's proclamation, excuse me. Redemption's proclamation. The redemption of the land, the redemption of the lady, and the redemption of the legacy. Three parts in redemption's proclamation. That is the land, the lady, and the legacy. The first layer is the redemption of the land in verse 9. In verse 9, Boaz again speaks, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belongs to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Boaz's words are representative of the legal transaction that's just taken place. Specifically when he says, you are witnesses today. That is, you have all seen it, we all understand what's happened, and now this is a legally verified testimony that has occurred before the elders and before all of the people that are present. Furthermore, he has the sandal of the close relative to verify the completion of the deal. And needless to say, the close relative has to walk home barefoot. Both Chilion and Malon's names are included in verse 9. And this shows that all that belonged to the house of Elimelech and all that passed to Elimelech's sons is now that which belongs to Boaz. So at the close of verse 9, we have the redemption of the land complete. Now, one thing you should note here is the thoroughness of Boaz's business dealings. This is so important for us to recognize in our day and age. And his above board and fully disclosed interactions at every turn. Beloved, all of our business deals need to be done out of the same heart and manner. Done in a most public manner. Do, done in a fashion that we would not care if everyone we knew, everyone in our church were there watching what was going on. Is that how our business dealings go on? If we're buying a, a new or used car, would we want the pastor over our shoulder while the negotiation was going on? 
if you're buying or refinancing your house, could you bring all of the matters here before the church? Would you be willing to discuss every detail? Or might you be concerned about the Ananias and Sapphira situation? You remember from Acts 5 when they sold property and then brought the funds, part of the funds, saying that it was all of them, and bring them before Peter and the church, and the Spirit of God takes Ananias' life, and shortly thereafter, Sapphira's, and he kills them both dead on the spot. Beloved, the church does see every business deal that you do. Or that is the head of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ sees every action. He hears every word. He knows every thought. While Boaz had redeemed the land and he had done so in an above board and upright manner, encouraging even in the manner that he presented it an action that he did not in his heart want. What a perfect representation. The second layer after the redemption of the land is the redemption of the lady in verse 10, where it says, Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birth. You are witnesses today. Boaz's speech is continued from verse 9, and this is the last time that we will hear from Boaz in the book of Ruth. We had heard the end of Ruth's interaction in chapter 3, and this is the conclusion of Boaz's statement. But his statement is emphatic. Notice the first word of verse 10, moreover. This shows what the Hebrew text makes clear. The main goal of this is redemption. And this is, this is the main point of all that's happened. The other's good. The land is good. I've done my due diligence. But moreover, more important than all of that is this. And what is this? It is Ruth. Ruth is the main goal of the redemption in his heart. Yes, the land's included. But it was a necessity element of attaining the goal. The, the literal Hebrew would read more like, I have acquired for myself. This is his goal. And this is the focus of the Goel, that is the kinsman redeemer, to continue the family name. He has speculated that Ruth, well, we have speculated rather, that Ruth was very likely among the crowd in this discussion. The crowd that would normally gather at the city gate during these type of events. Well, I expect there would be little doubt now if she was in attendance, don't you think? I suspect she would be jumping up and down. She would be so excited with the great joy of what's just happened. The beaming glow of her love would be unmistakable. It would light up the room. That dark little cavern of the city gate would be aglow with the delight of Ruth. You've seen this, haven't you? Seen that young couple in love and they're just so sappy. You know, that's how we all need to be. We all need to be that sappy every minute of our marriages and reflecting on the blessings that every minute is. We need to just be pressing forward as Fred's parents were towards 69 years, 70 years. Every day that the Lord would give us is a blessing with the husband or wife that God has given you because they are indeed a gift from the Lord. I'm sure that in, in one degree or another, Ruth's face at that point would have been very much like Moses after he came down from seeing God. She would have been shining. Well, the rest of verse 10 is Boaz's motivation. Again, this clearly shows that Ruth was the key aspect of the redemption. Boaz now shows why he desired to be the Goel, that is the kinsman redeemer, as he says, I have acquired for myself Ruth the Moabitess. And why? To be my wife. This shows that his motives are purely personal and that they are honorable. Notice there was nothing wrong with this. God honors the personal desires of his heart. This is when they are in line with his plans. This again points out the importance of this whole book as it relates to young couples or young individuals seeking marriage. Ask yourself, is this God's will? 
Are you seeking God's face at every turn? Making certain that you are fully above board, fully representing all that's going on. This is why we understand that, that for the young person in the Christian world, this whole idea of dating is a very dangerous situation. And, and we recognize, oh, a courting is an outdated and antiquated kind of notion. Fine, then let's talk about dating for marriage. Because this isn't just dating to get to know someone. This isn't just spending time and using uh, our resources where we can learn a, bit, a little bit what relationships are about. The critical issue is honoring God in all things and honoring his word. And this is what Boaz has done. And asking ourselves again, as we consider those important lifelong decisions of a covenant with another person in marriage, is this God's will? Is this what God is calling you to? Boaz indicates three other factors he desires to do here in verse 10. He seeks to raise up the name of the descendant on his inheritance. Shows Boaz's desire to bring up children on the ground that he has inherited. Second, he does not want the name of the deceased to be cut off. This phrase in Hebrew is the same as that of, uh, of not losing one's honor. So he wants to make sure that the honor is maintained. And third, he wants to make sure that the name of the deceased is not removed from the town. They will continue to have a representation in the city gate, literally. The family name will remain in the assembly of the elders and of the town. Boaz closes his speech the way he began. You are witnesses today. You have seen this thing and you are to bear witness to that which has occurred. The redemption of the land, the redemption of the lady, and our third point in redemption's proclamation is the redemption of a legacy. The redemption of a legacy. Clearly, it has been God's plan to redeem the land and the lady. The events which have led up to this could not have occurred otherwise. Indeed, they would not have occurred were it not for God's providential hand. But this point comes most dramatically as we consider the redemption of a legacy. Now we hear the people speak in verse 11. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. They first confirm Boaz's command that they are indeed witnesses. Yes, we are. We understand what has happened here. And the next proclamation is for his progeny. They pray that Ruth will bear children, that she would be fruitful. Children are a blessing from the Lord, as Psalm 127 proclaims, telling us that uh, the fruit of the, of the womb is a reward, and children are arrows in a, a man's quiver, and the prayer that it would be full of them. Blood children are a gift from God, and unfortunately, our world does not recognize that. We know that full well because there have been over 60 million children put to death over the last 30 plus years through abortion. One nurse said, in one part of our hospital, we fight day and night to keep little babies alive, while in another part, we're murdering them. What would God say? These people knew the Messiah. Theologically, not exactly right on, but certainly a great heart attitude. And the names the people use are significant. Leah and Rachel are the mothers, of course, of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And the word Ephrathah is significant. It means fruitful. The people wanted Ruth to be fruitful and bring honor to their little town. And this was the town in which Rachel was buried in Genesis 35, 19. But what was more important is the last reference in the verse, that to Bethlehem. And we're reminded of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth to me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The importance of these people continuing to have a name in the city, a name in the town, a name in Bethlehem, is this was the lineage 
of Christ. Verse 12 concludes this wonderful section and says, Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offering, offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Notice again the introductory word, moreover. Whatever we've just been talking about regarding the redemption of the legacy, this is even bigger. Well, how do you get bigger than that? Well, what does they tell us about what's going on in this verse? What other aspects of our, are here in this focus? Boaz's house is to be like that of Perez. Now, that's all fine and good, but why Perez? If we go to the, the genealogy of Matthew, we find that there are at least six generations between Perez and Boaz. So why not someone in between? Well, the text tells us because it explains that it is Perez who Tamar bore to Judah. Now, to understand this, we'd have to go back to Genesis 38. So here's your homework. Go back and read Genesis 38. I'd love to go through it. But you need to understand all that happened with Judah and Tamar. And it's a convoluted story and you need to go read it because it'll blow you away. But that text is all about the kinsman redeemer. We know from Genesis 46, although in front of Genesis 38, that's where the genealogy is. It shows that Judah's sons were Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. Five children. Judah took a Canaanite wife and bore the first two sons that were twins, Er and Onan. And what we understand from that is that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, before that happened, Judah had gone to get a wife for Er and it was Tamar. Following with me? Tamar and Judah are father and daughter-in-law. And so this whole convoluted story picks up as we recognize what's going on next. Then God kills Er because he's evil. Onan is supposed to come in as the kinsman redeemer. He refuses, and that's a whole thing I'm going to let you read on your own. And God kills him too. So that leaves Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. And Tamar goes to Judah and says, when will I have one of your sons as kinsman redeemer? That's what the law calls for. And Judah says, you just hang out. Shelah will grow up and then he will be your son. And Shelah does grow up and Judah gives him another wife. And Tamar's like, what? And so she disguises herself and she goes and has interactions with Judah. And she has a child. And that child is Perez and Zerah, another pair of twins. So, whoa, not exactly what Scripture tells us ought to be going on. In fact, it's directly contradictory. So what our text is highlighting is that Boaz, who had already, who we have already talked about and know is the grandson of Rahab, the harlot from Jericho, a Gentile lady of ill repute, and now that he is further from a deceitful and incestuous relationship of a father and daughter-in-law. Something forbidden in Scripture in Leviticus 18. But something God uses. Boaz was from the lineage no one would expect. And the people are highlighting this condition in this text. Not because they're highlighting the biblical violation, but because they're highlighting God's divine providence through all of these circumstances. And they're not just talking about Boaz and Ruth's immediately fam immediate family because they don't use the regular word for children. Notice it is the word offspring, oftentimes translated as descendant, someone further down the line than their immediate child. They are looking down the line to understand that the line of Judah, which they know is where the Messiah would come from, would be the one that through Boaz and Ruth would bring forth the Christ, the Messiah. And now through Perez via Tamar and Boaz via Rahab will come another unique descendant. Just as those relationships were that which no one expected or thought maybe could or would or should happen, 
so will come another, as Isaiah 7, 14 tells us. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Who would expect? Who would think? Well, we spoke of Micah 5, 2 earlier. Well, there's a few more verses just a couple later in Micah that I want to draw your attention to. Micah chapter 5 and verse 4. Listen to Micah chapter 5 and verse 4. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. The one who was coming through the line of Ruth and Boaz, the one who was the promised child, Emmanuel, God with us, is the one that would be great to the ends of the earth and be our peace. Beloved, this is the redemption of a legacy. This is what's being indicated to us. This is so much more than simple covenant obedience, although that is so important. But there is so much more going on that we see in the intricacy of the grammar of this text. This is the ultimate plan of redemption. And this is redemption's proclamation. And you can see Boaz proclaiming, as well as all of the people, proclaiming his redemption of the land and of this beautiful lady. And the people proclaiming the redemption of the promised Messiah that was coming. We've seen the three layers of redemption in God's plan, but the question is, where do you come in? Where do I come in? Well, right here. Right here in the redemption of a legacy. Beloved, this is the formal beginning of the line of Christ. Both Joseph and Mary will come from opposite sides of the lineage back to the great-grandchild of Boaz and Ruth. And this becomes your redemption. Your lineage goes back to David and Boaz and Ruth. Of course not your blood lineage, unless you are of Jewish descent. But something more important, your redemption lineage, your eternal lineage, your your eternal redemption in Christ. God has brought his perfect plan to fruition through some of the most unique circumstances. But doesn't that encourage you? No matter the background, No matter what's going on, God is in charge. No matter the depravity, God will work through it. Nothing can thwart the plans of the Almighty God. And as we move towards Christmas, this praise is so much more noteworthy. This is pursuing the plan of God's prize. And the question to us, beloved, is are we pursuing it? Are we pursuing the understanding that we are those who are redeemed and that there is a world around us and many in there, as the Lord told Paul in Corinth, I have many people in this city. How many people in this city that we interact with in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, in the grocery stores are the redeemed that the Lord has not yet called to himself? How many that will come as we do our food pantry distribution? How many in Tombov, Russia, How many of the military families? Beloved, these are our ministries. These are our opportunities to proclaim the redemption that is in Christ. How amazing is God's plan and how amazing it is that he's included you and me in it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your plan of redemption. Thank you that it is perfect and thank you that you have included us. Lord, we know we have nothing that we could, we have done to earn or deserve this. In fact, just the opposite. We have been the rebellious children that have crawled up in your lap and slapped you in the face telling you that we wanted you to do it our way. Forgive us for our shortcomings and strengthen us to realize, Lord, that you are working out your perfect plan. Help us to be a part of that. Help us to be your hands and your feet. Help us to be those vessels fit for honorable use, that which you would pour the life-giving water of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ into. And Lord, may we pour it out to the world around us that so desperately needs to hear. Father, thank you that you've opened our eyes and our ears and our hearts. And now, Lord, 
Help us to open our mouths that they may hear and know of you, the God in whom is perfect redemption and love. We praise you for your understanding of all these things in our lives and ask that you would guide us home safely tonight and be with us until you draw us together again. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. God bless.